Hey there, Capstone. I thought we would wrap up with affective polarization before we move on to issue identities. So one of the questions I asked you guys on the comment boards was, we see this affective polarization, this really, this dislike, this distaste for people from the other party, and we see partisan prejudice going on between these groups. But the authors don't really find that with ideological identification, at least not in those feeling thermometer measures that go up to 2012. And I asked you, do you think that this exists for ideological identifiers? And a bunch of you said yes. So even though they don't find, um, they don't find a ton of evidence of that, they didn't look that hard, to be honest, um, but also, it's worth mentioning that this absolutely does exist to a certain degree, particularly amongst people who are very political. But we also see this actually um, coming from elites as well. So I have some screenshots, as I always do, to show you that. Um, so over here, this is a tweet by David Dale who writes, David Clark, who is this man on the left in the hat, he's a sheriff, he's, quite conservative sheriff. He has lots of medals and he wears this hat a lot. He says, David Clark to a very bored audience on why he wears his hat. It pisses off the left and anytime I get a chance to tweak them, I do it. So that's clearly, he's trying, he's trying to piss off people that are liberal identifiers or people that are on the left. That is, affectively polarized language toward an ideological identity group. Over here on the right, we have uh, a screenshot of Matt Gates, who's been in the news a lot recently. He, he says, media kale and quinoa eaters look down on you know people like us. It doesn't finish the quote. Um, he's clearly stereotyping members of the media. He's insinuating that they're on the left. And he's and Ezra Klein, who's a journalist who writes for Vox, he writes this. This is what identity politics looks like. So even though we have this innate tendency to think that identity politics just means gender and race, pandering to those two things, it is way more than that, right? This is political identity politics, which is just as powerful, if not sometimes more powerful than stuff like race and gender politics. Here we have a Facebook post from Steve King. We've mentioned him before in class. Steve King, it says um, pretty openly white supremacist things, and he's been uh, condemned for that um, even by his own Republican caucus, but he writes, and by the way, I've, in case I haven't mentioned it, white supremacy is the pinnacle of identity politics. It doesn't get much more identity politics than that. But he writes, do you enjoy our memes? If so, please click the link below and throw us a few dollars to make sure the memes keep flowing and the lefties stay triggered, which is almost um, uh, a phrase that's become a joke at this point. Right When you want to trigger people from an ideological group, you want to set them off and make them really upset. So this is um, identity politics through and through that has to do with ideology. And then one more here. Again, Daniel Dale writes, Senator John Kennedy is speaking. He says he is a proud deplorable. That's a word that people um, who like Trump call themselves as a prideful derogatory phrase and unlike the cultured cosmopolitan goat's milk latte drinking avocado toast eating insiders elite that is there's there's so many ideological stereotypes in there i lost track but that's um sort of a, a ridiculous um version of ideological affective polarization so this stuff absolutely does happen we have seen it coming from politicians and elite members um, of, of, um, of politics as of late. So this, this is a thing that you'll see. But um, I wanted to start another topic. This is our last week of content before you guys give your presentations. So we've talked about political identities that are partisan and political identities that are ideological, but there are also some very particular issues 
that have identities around them. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about guns and you'll read about that for homework. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you guys some political advertisements that feature guns. I want to establish on the front end that guns are not just, um, they're not just an object that people own. There is a political identity that's been infused with gun ownership. This is probably not new to you, but you can see this um, in many different ways. And one is through political ads. So what I'm gonna do here is I am going to, this will take just a second. I'm gonna share YouTube videos and Last time I tried sharing YouTube videos, the sound wasn't great, so hopefully you can hear these. If you can't, I will link this in Oaks, but I think you should be able to hear them. So let's watch three political ads that are recent that feature guns. Here we go. This one is from Brian Kemp, who's in the news a lot in the last 24 hours. He was running for governor in Georgia and he won. Brian Kemp, this is Jake, young man interested in one of my daughters. Yes, sir. Jake asked why I was running for governor. I said, one, cap government spending. Two, take a chainsaw to regulations. Three, make Georgia number one for small business. And two things, if you're going to date one of my daughters, respect and a healthy appreciation for the Second Amendment, sir. We're going to get along just fine. Brian Kemp for governor. So as you saw in that, um, in that video, a gun was centrally featured. He does mention Second Amendment briefly, but most of that ad was not about Second Amendment. He also had guns next to him and behind him. So that ad got a lot of controversial airtime. People were debating whether it was necessary for him to point a gun at someone. Here's another one um, that actually comes right out of our own state. You may remember this one. Speaking of fair play, my granddaddy gave me this 38 to shoot the snakes around our fishing trailer. I'm Catherine Templeton. Today, it's state government with fair play problems, record spending by Republicans, public corruption, and a massive power failure that's cost ratepayers billions. I'm Catherine Templeton. We can't shoot the snakes slithering around Columbia, but we will end their poisonous big government ways. Catherine Templeton, the conservative shot for governor. So that one also um, generally had nothing to do with gun policy. It's just centrally featured almost as though it's trying to give off the air of some sort of political identity or some other type of identity. And then here is one more. Brightens is under attack from Obama's Democrat machine. They're trying to steal another Missouri election. But Eric Brightens is a conservative warrior. And when he fights back, he brings out the big gun. Eric Brighton, a governor who will set his sights on politics as usual, reduce spending, create jobs, protect life, defend the Second Amendment, and fight Obama's Democrat machine and their corrupt attacks. Good news for us, bad news for them. I'm Eric Brighton. Join our mission. Let's take back Missouri. Eric Okay, so I'm going to switch right back to the other screen share now. So as you could see, in, um, in those ads, guns were really centrally featured. There was also a lot of, uh, or not a lot of, but there, the three people were sort of um, identifying as conservatives, right? They had that like front and center at the end of the ad. So there's clearly some sort of fusion between guns and a more sort of political ideological identity going on here. So you can see that in ads. Um, Here's an interesting image. So on the left, you have what the country would have looked like in the 2016 election if we only looked at the votes of people who own guns. Okay, so these are gun-owning homes. The only state that would have gone for Hillary is Vermont. On the right, we have what this election would have looked like if we only counted the votes of people who do not own guns in their home and only West Virginia looks to be going for Donald Trump. So this is a very dramatic visual. Down here at the bottom, it says, uh, SurveyMonkey found that the voting divide between gun owners and non-owners 
was starker than the divides between white and non-white Americans, between working class whites and the rest of the nation, and between rural and urban voters. No other demographic characteristic created such a consistent geographic split. So there is clearly something very political going on here with guns. Here's the last visual from our friends over at Vox. On the left, you have the difference between um, people that have guns in their home versus no guns in their home and their support for Republican presidential candidates. So what you can see over here is that this gray area, that difference between these two groups has increased dramatically in 2012 since prior years. The visual over on the right is just showing you that difference in its own chart. But there's clearly some fusion once again between gun ownership and political identities in some kind of a way. There seems to be a strong correlation. So guns have obviously become very politicized. Um, here's the last one I wanted to show you. And this actually brings us right into um, the paper that you guys are gonna read for homework. So some random person on Twitter um, writes, what world does he, this guy here, live in where he needs three handguns to get groceries? And then he writes this derogatory like America uh, hashtag. But this picture over here, this guy who's walking out of a grocery store, he has three guns strapped to him and he has a gun on his t-shirt. And then Josh Chaffetz, who I think is a, a journalist up here writes, it's almost like these things are markers of identity politics and not really for self-defense at all. Because when you go into a grocery store, nobody actually needs three guns to defend themselves. That's complete overkill. I think most of us can agree on that. So he's saying, this person isn't wearing guns for defense, which is what guns are supposed to be used for. He's wearing it to flout an identity. So, Guns are, um, they are used to protect people, but it might be more than that, right? It might be A, infused with a political culture, ideology, and with partisanship. But then beyond that, it looks like gun ownership can be an identity in and of itself. So why? Why has gun ownership become an identity? Because it did not used to be an identity the way that it is now. There's always been something about it, but um, it seems to be quite identifying these days. So you guys are gonna read um, a fascinating article by this guy named Matthew Lacombe. This article was actually his dissertation and he published it in a top journal. It's called The Political Weaponization of Gun Owners. And he's gonna talk about how the NRA speaks to their membership to cultivate an identity, a social identity around guns. So that's what you guys are gonna read for homework. And then we can get into other issues, issue identities such as climate change and school choice. It's a pretty interesting um, topic. Uh, also, just a reminder, if you guys have questions about the final paper or the final presentation, please let me know. I'm here to help. Uh, but that's it for now, and I'll see you guys next time.